from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell. I'm in a TARDIS, believe it or not, in Melbourne. That's the name that ABC give to their contributors studio. So hence, if you're watching this on YouTube, it's the black background behind me. But I'm staying on in Melbourne for some Australian Open tennis. But there is so much cricket carrying on around the world, isn't there? The Big Bash in Australia carries on. The Aussie women are in action. Uh, SA20 League in South Africa, where there's a big focus because there's a first ever under 19s World Cup for the women starting there which is followed by the T20 World Cup as well so that is a hot focus and we'll be spending a bit of time looking at that on stumps in the coming weeks I'm sure. Hi it's Jim Maxwell for the ABC in Sydney and uh, yes test cricket's over for the time being but more to come in other places as we go on into this year but um, I suppose immediately on our minds is uh, the thought of Steve Smith and David Warner playing in the Big Bash. It's a, a rare appearance for them and a couple of other test players before things get busier in India. So that's coming up very shortly, apart from, uh, of course, Pakistan and Australia playing in a women's series very shortly. Well, we're all waiting for Australia to come to India. That should be a fantastic series. Hello, everybody. This is Charu Sharma for All India Radio. I am so glad to be back on Stump, back home as well. It was rather hectic the last month or two. And, of course, I've just returned from the ATP 250 event in Pune. Not quite the Aussie Open Alley, but we had a, a wonderful time. A new winner for a change, which is always good. But am I glad to be back? Gosh, and, of course, we've got some golf going on. Our club had uh, their draft in the auction, so there's a club league going on as well. I'm looking forward to some downtime. With the show this week, we're going to start by looking at what happened at the SCG last week. And I'm not talking specifically about the cricket because Jim and I witnessed history being made at the Sydney Cricket Ground when the world's first statue of a female cricketer was unveiled. Now, the identity of the legendary player was kept under wraps until the day itself. And she is a living legend, so actually able to enjoy this uh, in real life, which is great. Um, She captained Australia for 12 years, leading them to two World Cups playing 134 times in all for her country and headed up the women's game in Australia before it was taken over by Cricket Australia and the ICC. And since then, she's been at the fore of administration in the game from grassroots and community level all the way up to the elite in both the men's game as well as the women's. And she continues to mentor young players now. She's a member of the ICC Hall of Fame and the award for Outstanding Australian Female Cricketer of the Year is named after her as well. It's, of course... Belinda Clark, and she's with us on the programme. You've had a little bit of time to digest everything that happened when the statue was unveiled, and I did speak to you there in Sydney as well. So how does it feel, you know, a week or so on? Uh, Life's just returned to normal, which has been really nice. I was, um, uh, you know, it was a year of uh, preparation of um, getting to that point, and then all of a sudden it's on the doorstep. So it sort of took me by surprise, and I was um, just thrilled that my family could be part of it. That was probably the bit that, that was most, um, yeah, I look back fondly on. Um, but, yeah, normal transmission back in my life and it's sort of mm-hmm. nice to, to get back into that normal rhythm. Where did it come from, that image we have of you playing uh, an action shot? Yeah, so there's a, there's a, couple, of, um, there's a couple of shots that she sort of melded into, into this one and I think um, initially she created some little statues. They were a little, um, you know, about 10 centimetres high and she mm. took photos of them from 3D and said, look, I've got three photos that I think will, will work or three sort of um, poses. And then we talked about it and, and we chose the one that was the most adventurous um, quite deliberately. And, um, yeah, it just it, it sort of started to take form and um, I, I played a pretty traditional way, um, particularly early on in my career, and I probably got um, more expansive the longer I played. And so this shot was sort of at the back end of the career trying to slog one over. Um, over mid wicket. Um, <laughs> traditionally, if you just if you thought, I think if I think of myself about where did I score most of my runs, I'd probably through cover, um, backward point, mid off. Um, so um, you know, this this was something that sort of came. I worked really hard on creating a leg side game, so I was quite proud of the fact that you know we we found an image that that had something in it that I had to work really hard to to obtain, which was this bit more expansive game over the leg side. Uh, you sort of a surprised at uh, the rapid development of women's cricket in the last 10 years from basically a, a sort of amateur 
occasionally professional sport to full-time professionalism now? Uh, I'm relatively impatient as a person. I think that's mm -hmm. a trait that I have. So um, I wouldn't have said it's rapid. Um, I feel like it's been coming for quite some time. I am surprised. I certainly was surprised that we got 86,000 to watch a, a T20 World Cup final um, in 2020. That that did surprise me. I'm not surprised the game's professionalised. I'm not surprised um, at the quality of cricket that we're seeing Um and it's just wonderful. The, you mentioned the Under-19 World Cup in South Africa, but that, that to me, along with the, the IPL um, becoming, um, you know, having a women's event as well, they're the two things I think that are going to create a massive change in what we're seeing and, and hopefully shift that trajectory from where we're, what, we're, what we're on now to um, what is possible, which will be a little bit, little bit quicker and making sure the game continues to grow everywhere because I think that's really important for cricket to be interesting and inspiring it needs to be a global sport and to be a global sport it needs to have a strong international competition and I think the under 19 world cup will help us achieve that Australia seem to be winning at will they won two out of the last three 50s and they've won what five out of the 70 20s which is great for Australian cricket but we do want some competition don't we we can't see have them running away all the time so how do you see um, the new uh, um, women's cricket league in India because we can't quite call it the women's IPL just yet what are your thoughts on on the naming of this uh, new league to be in India because I mean would you like it to just be an extension of the IPL such as the WBBL or would you like a completely different entity how do you stand there uh, I think the IPL has a has a, a brand and a name and it's it's big and it's brash and it's bold and it's got superstars attached to it. Um, I would leverage that um, with the women's comp. So if, if you're going to go and start with a new name, you then need to go and convince everyone and, and get another, another term into the vernacular, whereas everyone knows the BBL, the IPL, um, you've got to have three letters. The WBBL doesn't quite work, but anyway, um, <laughs> I think that I think um, I, I would leverage it. I, people know what it is. I would I would call it the same, and I would put the teams the same, and I would let them go at it. Belinda, you were saying earlier about um, in order to grow the game, it needs to be played everywhere, and everyone needs to be playing it. Notably. We've heard that um, Australia's men are pulling out of their ODI series against Afghanistan, and that is a, is a direct consequence of the fact that Afghanistan women are not playing cricket due to the Taliban regime in that country. How do you see this unpicking and unpacking for Afghanistan as a, as a team? You've been involved in administration. You'll have a good sort of view of both sides of, of the fence. But as a female administrator wanting the game to be widespread everywhere, what do you think a, a solution or what action, if any, should be taken as regards the, the situation with Afghanistan? Men being able to play cricket, but the women not. I think it's, um, it's a basic human right, I, I think, that people should be able to play sport. Um, so if you've got part of your country without that basic human right, I think um, you've got a problem. Um, I know the ICC is in a difficult position about how they might manage that amongst amongst members, et cetera. But if sport's not going to stand up and say, um, you know, you need to be equitable, you need to be providing opportunities for both, both genders, then, um, you know, who's going to do it? So I think it's a... I think it's a reasonable move and it'll be interesting to see what impact it has. Um, it's one of those situations that you just got to keep monitoring and stay, keep the dialogue open and um, keep trying to help people see the benefits of perhaps allowing um, everyone to play sport. Belinda, congratulations again on being immortalised in bronze. We're absolutely thrilled for you. Thanks so much for coming on Stump to have a chat. It's been great to see you all. Thank you very much. As Belinda Clark, former Australia captain and now in bronze at the SCG. Now let's pick up further on the story that Australia's men have withdrawn from their one day international series against Afghanistan, which is due to play, take place in the UAE in March. Now, in a statement, Cricket Australia explained that the decision came after the Taliban's recent announcements about further restrictions being placed on women and girls' education and employment in the country. It is part, remember, of the ICC's constitution around full members that uh, to be a full member, to be a 
test playing nation as Afghanistan is, then they must be supporting a, a women's team as well as a men's team. And Afghanistan have not been fulfilling uh, that obligation. They had a fledgling women's department set up, but and progress was being made, as we heard from Tuba. You can go back online and search for our episode that featured her to get a, the full picture and her opinions on the situation in Afghanistan. Jim, as regards this particular series, I mean, the men had already withdrawn from a test match, hadn't they, against Afghanistan. So was this something that you had seen coming or surprised? I'm not surprised. Um, I'm just hoping that there is some dialogue that continues as this issue uh, continues to be a, a problem for the game. I mean, it, it's obviously that. And the, there were hints uh, when the Taliban first came to power that perhaps it could be an accommodation somehow, but that doesn't seem to be the case at all. Uh, so um, you don't just sh- shut the gate completely because you've got to hope there's a way that this can be negotiated, discussed, whatever, and uh, get women back into the fold. But um, it doesn't look very promising. And uh, also it doesn't look very promising for particularly Australia playing any cricket, male or female, against uh, Afghanistan in the near future. So that is disappointing, but um, I'm sure the um, the Australian government would be suggesting to Cricket Australia that um, it's not... um, it's not something that they should be in, encouraging in any way until there's a change of attitude from Afghanistan. But um, we'll see what happens. Yeah, Charu, I mean, notably when the fixtures for the under-19s Women's World Cup came out, there is no Afghanistan there amongst you know, test-playing nations and then countries like Rwanda who are featuring in it, uh, the UAE featuring in it. There's been an ICC working group, hasn't there, to monitor the situation. But to my knowledge, that is all that's been happening. They've been monitoring and nothing has changed since the day the Taliban first came back into Afghanistan. What's your take? Well, a lot of disappointment for sure for the Afghanistan girls particularly, because, I mean, they they must surely be looking forward to making a mark in the world of cricket as their men have. And uh, how far have they gone along that road? Perhaps not that far. So uh, at this point of time, they need to be given the opportunity because obviously the talent exists. However, what's confusing to me is that I'm glad, of course, that Australia, uh, uh, the Australian cricket team have made this call, have taken this decision because obviously the world needs to sit up and take notice. And, and uh, a lot of people do believe that sports persons have a, a, a very loud voice in such matters. But you mentioned the ICC working group. Now, surely they're keeping an even closer tab than individual nations because it matters so much to the ICC to make sure that cricket grows. And it would have been nice to have received uh, news from the ICC working group on Afghanistan to the rest of the cricket playing world that, listen, there is no progress or an, you know, an update would have helped uh, all cricket playing nations take similar decisions because right now it might look like a little random Australia decision. But of course, it has to go well beyond that. And what do the rest of the nations do? So I I, I applaud Australia, but I also implore the ICC to come out with a a policy right now or an update at any rate, which can pave the way for other nations to also take such calls as we go along. But if the the women in, uh, in Afghanistan are truly being stopped from playing cricket, that's dangerous. But I mean, the Afghanistan government, I suppose, could turn around and claim that they just are not playing now. But we can't hit them with a hammer on the head to say, well, you must play cricket because we need you to. So I really don't know what the situation in Afghanistan regarding women cricketers and, and the, uh, the motivation for them to play or even the permission. Is that really a problem? I don't know. We need to know a lot more, that's for sure. And if there's a working group, the ICC, as you suggest, then, as we know, then that's where all this information should be detailed. Now, for years on this program, we've been asking the question about when a women's version of the Indian Premier League might launch. And we finally got the answer. And that is this March. It is happening. But just how much detail have we got about the tournament when it's only uh, a few months away? But first of all, Charu, there's uncertainty even about what the competition will be called. And there's Mm. been reports that it won't actually be called the Women's IPL. What can you tell us? <laughs> Very little, Alison, <laughs> sadly, because you say there's uncertainty about the name. I'm saying there's uncertainty about everything right now. 
And there are, according to the start date we heard some time back, less than two months. So it sounds ridiculous, but I mean, the name is just one thing. And, and frankly, that's the least of it. Uh, what do I think? I think it should be called the Women's IPL to piggyback on what's a really big name in, in the world now. Uh, there's no harm doing that because it's just sort of, it's after all managed by the same board, the same sort of people. But uh, that's the least of it. They can announce the name of the tournament two days before if they wish, or, you know, I'm being a little silly here, but that's the least of it. The fact that the teams haven't been decided yet, the franchises have not been given out yet, who's going to be owning them, uh, and the players have to come from around the world, lots of planning there in terms of transport and everything else. You can throw money at it, I suppose, and you can get everything organized in two weeks. But it just is a you know, bit of a pity that all this has not been decided quickly enough because once uh, the cricket board did decide going for a women's IPL, a decision always been waiting for for years and talking about when, uh, then everything should have fallen into place very quickly because it's not that it's the first league that the board is organizing. I mean, it, it, it's something that the Indian administration should easily be ready for. So why the delay? Because it just will cause unnecessary confusion. And to me, it looks like not enough respect is being given to women's, oh, well, the women's IPL, forget about women's cricket, that's a stretch. Uh, because to have everything organized well in time indicates a robust administration. To not even have a name finalized this point of time, which is the least of it, just reeks a little bit of, 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 of lack of attention. And that's such a pity mm. because if there are mistakes that, are, that could happen, they will happen. You know what's going to happen, don't you? There will be a, an auction that takes place bang in the middle of the Women's T20 World Cup. Although you can probably bet it won't happen on a day that India are playing, but it will be on the day where there could serve as a big distraction for a couple of teams. Uh, Jim, one report suggesting that the league will be just known as the Women's T20 League, which seems very unimaginative. <laughs> what do you think about it? I mean, does it not need to write, you know, be part of the, the IPL brand, which is so strong? Oh, it's all come out of the same stable, I think. So what's wrong with the women's IPL? Um, but um, it sounds like they've got more pressing concerns about the, the whole process that leads to the first ball being bowled with uh, teams, television rights. Yes, they've got a few things to sort out. So I, I, would, I would think that the actual name of the tournament isn't a priority at the moment. But Charu? I, I, I do think that the Women's T20 League is just a sort of a, a, a working name, a name to go along A holding with. name. A holding name. But to, to me, it does also seem like the enormous commercial success that the franchisees currently enjoy in the IPL is something that's giving uh, the administration um, a lot of heart and delaying everything because they know that the guys are making so much money now in the in the IPL, the teams, that surely they will pick up the franchises and surely it'll be an extension of their team and their management team as well. So everything will fall into place very quickly, which is not allowing for newer entities to come in because if newer entities do come in, they require much more time in terms of managing their own teams and, and setting up infrastructure. Uh, uh, infrastructure going, their, their whole management team going as well. Uh, and uh, I, I suppose they have to t take charge of a certain ground. So uh, it's not allowing for newer people to come in and be as organized as some of the older franchises, should they be able to get the WIPL, if we can call it that franchise. That is all we've got time for on Stump for this week. So my thanks to Jim Maxwell and Chari Sharma and of course to all of you. And we'll see you again same time next week. Bye for now. From the BBC World Service in association with ABC and All India Radio, this is Stumped.